What we could use a lot less of is misinformation about the vaccine because conspiracy theories are like spreading like crazy around these vaccines and they have been for months. I mean, this didn't just start long before the vaccine was even available. Kristen Severance looked into this huge problem to find out what we can do to stop it. Misinformation flooded our news feeds in 2020. Article after article sowing distrust about fill in the blank, COVID, the Oregon wildfires, the election, and now the COVID-19 vaccines. So we did Rory Smith with First Draft, an organization that studies misinformation, said when researching vaccine misinfo, instead of just identifying the articles, videos or individual posts spouting false claims, they focused on the narratives linking all of those separate items together. Because you can't simply debunk or label a narrative, right? Narratives are directly aligned to our sense of self and how we make sense of the world. False narratives like the vaccine was developed too quickly to be safe. Doctors, scientists and researchers say that's not true. They had been working on a vaccine for similar viruses for years. So when COVID happened, they knew what worked and what didn't. Myths that the vaccine is not necessary. People have claimed falsely a better way to fight the virus is through natural immune responses. In reality, that's not true. Experts don't know how long natural immunity lasts after recovering from COVID. Immunity varies from person to person, and some people have gotten COVID twice. And baseless claims about the ingredients of the vaccine and mRNA. Many have claimed that vaccines can alter your DNA. This is false. Both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are made of messenger RNA. This component never enters the nucleus of the cell where the DNA is kept, so it does not have the capability to mutate the DNA in any way. Many of these false narratives can be found on the Oregonians for Medical Freedom Facebook page. The anti-vaccine group was started five years ago. They have 12,000 Facebook followers, a website and board of directors. Bob Snee is on the board. Have you seen support for your organization grow over the past few months? Do you uh, see a lot of people joining? Getting a lot of requests um, through our website for people wanting more information, how they can get involved. Since 2019, the anti-vaccine movement has gained almost 8 million digital followers. Oregon has long been a hotspot for the anti-vaccine movement. A 2019 study from the CDC found Oregon had one of the highest vaccine exemption rates among kindergartners in the country, 7.7 percent compared to 2.5 percent nationwide. You are not a scientist. You are not a doctor. You know, you, you said you're an attorney, but mm -hmm. you've said a lot of um, medical statements during this interview. I read a lot of science. I read a lot of scientific journals. I have lots of doctor friends. But why should people listen to you? They should. They should do their own research. But the problem, according to experts, anti-vaccine research is often based on flawed science, half-truths, and debunked studies. Right now, what we're seeing is... Jonathan Berman, an assistant professor from the New York Institute of Technology, wrote a book on the anti-vaccine movement. He said these groups aren't bad people. They're just using bad information. So the typical anti-vaxxer is not someone who's uneducated, it's not someone who's, who's foolish, it's someone who's trying to make the best decision for themselves and their family they can. They're just using bad information. Bad information can flourish during something called a data deficit. That's when there is a high demand for information and a short supply of credible information. So people fill the void with misinformation and conspiracy theories. Data deficits thrive on social media. Smith said anyone can fall for it. We take so many mental shortcuts and there's so many cognitive biases that that we can, we, we latch on to what we already believe in, in a sense, and social media platforms will reaffirm that by serving us content that kind of adheres or is similar to, to our worldviews. So what can we do to fight the never-ending stream of misinformation? Share accurate information from reputable news sites, the CDC, scientists, and doctors. It's essentially identifying these data deficits before they can be filled with misinformation and before kind of misleading narratives take hold altogether. And what about the people who truly believe the misinformation and continue to share it? One of the least effective ways of convincing someone with 
vaccine hesitancy or who's, who is an anti-vaxxer or is the information deficit model. Where I say I'm wearing a, a white coat and I have information, so you better listen to me. Um, that usually doesn't work. Berman said you probably won't change someone's mind who is truly committed to the anti-vaccine movement. But there's a difference between someone who is anti-vaccine and someone with questions. But if someone just has some doubts or, or skepticism, then having that, that conversation where you've created a space where it's safe to them to explore those ideas without feeling assaulted or, or feeling like they're being made fun of, then... I think that can be a lot more persuasive. The dehumanizing effects of calling it silly or, or wacko is, is quite detrimental. And that further polarizes people, essentially. Because if, 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 well, if they see that other people are, are treating them as such, that's just going to further entrench their worldview. And it's going to create this kind of adversarial environment of, of us versus them, right? Which is already a severe issue in the U.S. And that's something we can all agree on. All right, Kristen joining us now. Let's talk about this for just a second. Let's talk about the role that social media companies play. This has been very controversial. Facebook has started to flag false or misleading content. Yeah, so the big question, is that working? But some experts say flagging content actually makes it worse because then those groups say that they're being censored. Right, so... Um, it's going to get spread. If you try and censor it, it creates a problem. Mm -hmm. What are we supposed to do? Because it kind of seems like an unsolvable problem at this point. So I interviewed uh, the CEO of a nonprofit called the Center for Countering Digital Hate today. Super interesting conversation. And he said it's simple. Well, it's not simple, but I think it's great. It's a great answer. We need to amplify the good content. You know, we need to really share and be talking about the accurate information that vaccines are safe and effective and necessary. And I know that's something that, you know, we try to do here on the story every day. Absolutely. Kristen, thank you so you much. Bet.